Welcome back to the Global Startup Movement. I'm your host, Andrew Berkowitz. Today, we have a great episode on the Mexican startup ecosystem with the pioneer of both e-commerce and startups in Latin America, Marcus Dantas. Marcus founded Mexico.com, Mexico's first online community and internet portal back in 1996, which was later acquired in 2003. Marcus then proceeded to found numerous successful tech companies before taking on a leadership role in helping to build the Mexican startup ecosystem, having run organizations such as Waira Mexico, founding Startup Mexico, and serving as a shark on Shark Tank Mexico. We have yet to do a real deep dive on the Mexican startup ecosystem, so it was great to get this episode in, and now I'll hand it off to Marcus Dantas, the CEO and founder of Startup Mexico. Entrepreneurship has become a global phenomenon. Uncover the stories of entrepreneurs and investors worldwide. From Sub-Saharan Africa to Silicon Valley and beyond. Here on the Global Startup Movement. Now, here's your host, Andrew Berkowitz. So Marcus, thank you so much for joining us today. I would love to start off with just a little bit about your story and really the the story behind Startup Mexico's founding. Sure. Thank you for inviting me, of course. I'm actually an entrepreneur, you know, and, and I've been an entrepreneur for many years. And every time anybody asks me why I'm an entrepreneur, it's honestly because I have problems with authority. And uh, since I was very young, I, I decided to, to build my own path. For many years, I, I created companies, basically in the ITC area. And then, in uh, you know, some of them were very successful, some of them were not. And then in uh, 2007, I was asked by a friend of mine to become his partner in a medical device company. And uh, we turned that around and sold it to a fund. And then I, I was kind of tired, to be honest. I, I, I decided to, to leave the entrepreneurship world. I thought I was retiring for a while. And I started giving classes in a university. In this university, it was a, it's a university that's focused on creative, uh, you know, creative stuff like TV and cinema and uh, design. And I thought we should create um, an incubator for the university. So we created the, the Entrepreneurship Center for the university. And I ran that for a while. And then I got approached by Telefonica. At that time, they had built Waira Colombia. Waira is their ITC accelerator. And they asked me to um, if I could open Waira Mexico, which was the second one they wanted to open. And I said, sure. So I entered fully into the accelerator incubator world. And then after a couple of years, you know, I, I, I was with them for a, around three years and I learned a lot of stuff. But I also learned a lot of stuff that I thought didn't work or at least didn't work in Mexico. So I decided to create my own. And uh, that's how Startup Mexico got started. We, we initially thought, you know, Mexico was creating this ecosystem for entrepreneurs and everybody in Mexico was saying that Mexico was going to be the next Silicon Valley. And I thought that was completely wrong and that we shouldn't even aspire to be that. And I had a, a talk with the government and I thought, I basically told them, look, Mexico has great talent and we are in the middle of Latin America and the U.S. And we have a lot of commercial treaties. We have a lot of assets that, you know, enough that we should be creating our own model. And what I proposed was that Mexico become kind of a um, bridge for innovation and entrepreneurship between Latin America and the first world, the developed world, and vice versa. And uh, they agreed, and, you know, they funded us initially, and that's how Startup Mexico got started. Awesome. And so now Startup Mexico has uh, campuses in four different areas, Mexico City, Merida, Shallows, and forgive me if, if I butcher this, uh, Querétaro. Well, we actually have seven offices. Seven offices. We have seven offices uh, in, in different cities in Mexico. Got it. And uh, we, we have one office in Sao Paulo, Brazil as well. Well, I'd, I'd be curious to hear kind of what, um, 
foreigners, when they think of Mexican startup ecosystem, uh, they would probably default to Mexico City. Um, so I'd be curious just to hear from you, you know, what would you say are really the, the primary tech hubs right now within the Mexican landscape? Well, the most famous one is actually Guadalajara, not Mexico City. Okay. Guadalajara is a city that used to be called the, the, the Silicon Valley of Mexico. You know, the way I think of it is, you know, that's an incorrect assessment because they do have a lot of factories that make silicon chips. But they're not. They weren't really focused on high value entrepreneurship. But but it is a tech hub. I mean, there's a lot of universities. There's a lot of now. There's a lot of startups going on there. Uh, Mexico City, of course, is the largest city, and because of it, it is the largest tech hub. It is where you know most of the money, the funds are concentrated, the incubators, accelerators, etc. There's no comparison. I, I would say that maybe 70 or 80% of everything regarding entrepreneurship is in Mexico City. And then you have hubs like Monterrey, which should be very entrepreneurial. It's, it's probably the most entrepreneurial city in Mexico, but that really hasn't gone into the entrepreneurial spirit. And then you have places like Merida, which are actually very interesting because Merida, which is the Yucatan Peninsula, is a city that is kind of Outside of the Mexican scope, they actually try to become independent at some point. And uh, people don't really talk about it, but right now it's booming with entrepreneurship and innovation and incubation, etc. So I would say that there's some surprising cities in Mexico, like Merida, like uh, Querétaro that has a great aerospace industry, like León, in general, Guanajuato that has a lot of uh, technology parks. But in reality, Mexico City surpasses them all and maybe followed closely by Guadalajara, no? Right. I'm not too knowledgeable on, um, on really uh, the, the Mexican startup ecosystem, but from the research I've done, it seems like one of the big gaps is the local corporates being kind of slow to, to launch venture capital arms, to make investments locally, to make acquisitions locally. Um, and, and so, I mean, what, why do you think that is? Why do you think uh, you know, Mexico's corporate landscape has kind of fallen behind some of the rest of the ecosystems of the world? Well, that, that, that's a very interesting question. I think it has to do with many things. I think it has to do with, with culture uh, in the sense that Mexicans are very averse to risk and, and, uh, and we don't tolerate failure and we punish success and you know, all those kinds of things. I think it also has to do with protectionism. You know, for many, many years, Mexico was, you know, had a lot of monopolies. And these monopolies were pretty safe and couldn't really be bothered by startups. I also think because the ecosystem is very young as well. You know, it's probably an ecosystem that's like the real ecosystem is five, six years old. And, and we don't have that many success stories. So once we start getting those success stories, once we start getting these companies growing and you know, exiting properly, I think that the corporates are going to get more into the game. But now, this past couple of years, there's a lot of corporates that have entered into the startup uh, game and into the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems. We are still way behind many other countries, but I think that that this is going to happen pretty fast. Right. I mean, yeah, it definitely makes sense to me that Mexico is kind of on the, the younger side in terms of its ecosystem development. Uh, but I mean, if you if you had to point to to one piece of the Mexican startup ecosystem, uh, you know, wh whether it's a lack of quality deal flow, lack of capital, lack of talent, um, I mean, would you say there's kind of a, a single missing piece that kind of stands out to you as maybe the, the the individual point that's lacking in the ecosystem? Well, let me tell you this: talent is overwhelming in Mexico, so so that's not the problem. I think money is not a problem. I think, you know, we've, we've grown from maybe three seed and VC funds in 2008 to over 60 in the last, you know, seven, eight years. And actually, it's really funny because, I, uh, you know, funds complain that there's not enough projects and startups complain there's not enough funds. And I've always said that they probably need like a party to meet each other. But in reality, money is scarcer than it may look because of the aversion to risk from these funds. 
Uh, but the biggest component that I think is missing is success stories. I think we need to have a couple of very successful exits to really complete the virtuous circle that the ecosystem should be. Right. That makes sense. And I mean, so so putting on your your, your ducks capital hat, you know, how, how have you seen the deal flow evolve since you uh, really started started Mexico and started to get uh, you know involved in helping the ecosystem grow? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an idea. We we get our deal flow from Startup Mexico. We get our deal flow now also because I'm part of the Shark Tank program. We get our deal flow from there as well. But also because because of both, people know us and we get a lot of deal flow from outside of you know Startup Mexico and Shark Tank. And I'll tell you that it's hard for us to keep up with all the projects that are coming to pitch us. So we have more than enough deal flow. We are actually struggling on the other side, which is trying to keep up because we are raising our fund. And this is an election period in Mexico, which usually stops the country for a while. And we are struggling with that. So we are, while we're looking at these deals, we're raising the second and third part of our of our fund. Dilfo is not the problem. Got it. And so... You gave a talk, uh, I believe it was a, a, about a year or two years ago in South America, where you said that in Latin America, we are very creative, but we're not innovators. Um, and, and so I'd be curious to hear you kind of expand on, on that and, and what exactly you mean by that. So if you look at creativity in Latin America in general, and specifically in Mexico, you will see that Mexicans have an amazing way of solving problems, solving personal issues by themselves. This is due to the fact that either we don't trust institutions or sometimes we feel that institutions don't want to help us. So we, we solve these problems ourselves. The problem that we have is that it's not, innovation is not in the school curriculum. Nobody has taught us innovation techniques. So usually we end up solving stuff in a, in a very empiric way by being, again, very creative but not in a way that the end result will be a product or service that can benefit the world. It usually is a product or service that can benefit me during you know, how long the problem lasts. So that's what I mean by it. I, I think creativity is not an issue. The problem is that we need to foster this creativity into turning it into innovation uh, capabilities, and we haven't done that yet. And so, I mean, do, do you feel like that stems from the kind of cultural thoughts towards the, towards the idea of failure, where failure in Mexico is not really an acceptable thing, right? And in, in order to innovate, I mean, it's just repeated failure and surviving until you can figure out, you know, exactly what you're selling, exactly who you're selling to. And so is that kind of, do you think that's where it stems from? I think that's definitely a factor, but I think that there's much more important factors such as education. And we, we need to be educated into fostering more this creativity. We need to change the, the school system. I mean, that, that applies to everybody in the world, but, but in Mexico specifically, we are not necessarily taught, you know, how to apply innovation techniques like, you know, design thinking or brainstorming, brainstorming or uh, blue ocean, red ocean or... You know, all these the Bono techniques that will allow us to come up with much more interesting, long-lasting, and wider applying solutions to problems. Right. Right. So you mentioned before um, that you, uh, you're you involved in, as a shark on, on Shark Take Mexico. So I'll just be curious to kind of hear how that came about and kind of the story of how, of how you became that shark. Well, it was funny. I mean, they called me a couple of times. I actually said no, because I thought the exposure in Mexico would be kind of dangerous. And then they kept on calling me. And I I started thinking that it may be good to have actually a shark from the actual startup ecosystem, you know, because all these other guys, they're, you know, they're self-made millionaires and and they're, they're very successful, but they're not necessarily involved in the ecosystem. So uh, I decided to try it out. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm happy with the results. I think, uh, you know, I'm nowhere near as successful as the other gentleman or lady that are on the program. 
but I think I bring a different element, which is knowledge of the startup ecosystem, understanding of the technology, uh, stuff like that. Right. And I mean, I, I definitely think that's important. Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen in, in the US, I think that uh, Shark Tank becoming a, 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 as big as it is has kind of instilled or, or at least contributed to this renewed uh, spirit of, of entrepreneurship and startups in America. And so I, I think it's a, it's a really great thing that Shark Tank Mexico launched. I feel like it's, you know, helping to contribute to the change in mindset as well locally. Let me, let me, let me tell you, I, I'm com- convinced that there has been no initiative in Mexico that has generated more interest for entrepreneurship than the program. I mean, you'd be amazed how many people watch it and how many people want to become entrepreneurs because of it. And I think that's great on a cultural uh, you know, on a cultural side. Now, there are people, and they might be correct, that disagree and say that Shark Tank is actually bad because it's a, it's, a, it's a show at the end of the day, and it's not really what entrepreneurs go through. And I would tend to agree with that, but I think that the positive more than makes up for the negative. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think maybe the only bad thing about it is it creates this false perception of how capital is actually raised and, and the process that, that, that goes into it. You know, you don't just uh, show up for, for one pitch and it's a yes or no. It's a, you know, uh, it's relationship building. Um, so, you know, we, we create a lot of content on the show around entrepreneurship in, in emerging markets all around the world. And I, I find that depending on the market that we're doing a show in, um, there are always unique challenges locally in, in building a startup um, and, you know, when I say unique challenges, an example that I use is in uh, Nigeria as a startup, you have to factor in your, your monthly gas costs to run a generator in order to, to power your office, right? And so in Mexico, you know, are there any, uh, you know, unique challenges that if I was an entrepreneur coming from the U.S. to Mexico to start a company that, uh, you know, I, I would need to be aware of? So I, I, I would say I would divide them in two. The, the first part would be cultural. The second one would be systemic. On the cultural side, I think that aversion to risk, intolerance of failure, punishing success, all those kinds of things affect us. I think this is changing and it's changing for the positive, but it's going to take a little while longer. On the systemic side, I think the biggest problem is the lack of trust for institutions. You know, the, the, the lack of trust also from institutions to startups. Let, let me tell you one of the biggest problems in Mexico, in my opinion, is that government or large corporations very rarely buy from a startup. And that's where startups can really thrive. So just not trusting these new companies is a problem. I think also large companies, and I think it, it, it's happening now, but it, it didn't for many years. Large companies have to start looking at startups as number one, serious competitors, that could take a niche or two away from their biggest markets. And second, as, you know, ways in which they themselves can innovate faster, acquiring these startups. And this is, again, moving in the right direction, but very slowly. I think corruption is a, is very bad because I think companies in Mexico still grow thinking that by cheating a little bit, they can go faster and they forget that this is a global competition now and they need to do things properly not just the way they perceive it in mexico but globally so so i would say those are like the biggest challenges i i we don't need to power uh, you know our office with a generator or anything like that uh, we have a lot of resources mexico is a, is a very rich country it's not distribution of wealth is not you know it's not well distributed but i think that Entrepreneurship is a great equalizer. And I think that if we co- keep on fostering it, you're going to start seeing a lot of success stories coming from all the areas in the social demographic curve, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I definitely hope that happens. You know, we just had a, did an episode really on, on, on a similar topic in, in Africa on the, the need for more corporates to launch venture capital arms because one, it provides more liquidity and capital within uh, the ecosystem, but it's a huge benefit for the corporate as well because it allows them to innovate much faster and it exposes them to some of the, the, the localized technologies where uh, I'm sure it's the case in Mexico. I think a lot of entrepreneurs in emerging markets underestimate the advantage that they have because of the localization factor 
of uh, you know the local culture and doing business locally where international companies coming in wouldn't be able to operate as quickly, understand the market as well uh, as someone who's been on the ground their whole life and who's you know been spent their professional career there. I completely agree. And actually, I've been in Africa as well. And I think that the, the only region that is behind Latin America as a region is actually Africa. But I think they're taking great, stri- great strides to move Africa along. I, I've seen you know countries like Kenya or Nigeria, I mean, really put a lot of effort into creating an ecosystem. And I think Latin America needs to keep on pushing forward if we don't want to you know, lose more, more steps in the, in, the, in the ecosystem ladder, if you will. So Marcus, we always finish off with a quick fire round, four questions up to 60 seconds per one. How does that sound? Yeah, that's great. So who is a CEO in Mexico that you admire the most right now and why? I, I mean, I have to say Carlos Slim, and, and, and I'll tell you why. He, he's a guy that has done amazing things, uh, has grown to become a, a real you know, contender for you know, one of the greatest uh, entrepreneurs and, 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 uh, in the world. He, he has headed his companies. Every, everything he touches turns to gold. You know? There may be arguments about you know, the, how, how it's been done or if he's, if he's used to influence or whatnot. But I think that it's, he's a person that has adapted to Mexican reality and has really grown. And I actually had the opportunity to meet him. And, and he's a, a, a guy that really wants to help Mexico in general, not, not just help himself. And I think that's very admirable. So you spent kind of the early part of your career building uh, and exiting very successful technology companies in Mexico. Uh, and so what's kind of one, maybe one of the biggest lessons that you've learned going through that experience? I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is that, and, and you know, it's now it's, it seems obvious because of the way startups are built now, but there is a problem with trying to build a product that responds to your capability of building a product or a service, not necessarily to a need from the market. That is a very common mistake that I think startups make and I've made. And you have to listen to the market. You have to listen to your clients. You have to listen to what they will buy and how they will buy it. And you have to shape it that way. So if I was in Mexico City right now and I have a flight early morning tomorrow, uh, what's one thing that you would recommend that I need to do in the city before I leave? Well, for starters, you need to leave early because <laughs> there's a lot of traffic in the morning. But uh, you have to, you have to, for example, walk around the Condesa Roma neighborhoods, and you will feel very much like in you're in Soho in New York or in Silicon Valley. You know, an ambience of entrepreneurship, etc. Of course, of course. Before that, you have to have a really good traditional Mexican meal because. People have this wrong idea about Mexican food in general. And finally, what is your favorite thing about uh, living in Mexico? Mexicans. I think we have an amazing culture. We are, we are people that love to be hospitable. We welcome everybody. We are happy people. We are resilient no matter what the problem is. I, and again, I think probably the food. I mean, if there's something that I miss whenever I travel is Mexican food. <laughs> and so me- Mexican food in the U.S. isn't true Mexican food? Well, you actually have some places that have true Mexican food. You you confuse Mexican food with Tex-Mex food, <laughs> which is not the same. Uh, for and I'll give you an example. You know, okay. You know a chimichanga? Of course. I've, I've never even heard that word until I went to the U.S. So that's that's not a Mexican food, and and, and so Got it. you know you you have to change your your vision on Mexico. That makes sense. Well, Marcus, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you coming on the show. No, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. Be sure to add Andrew on Snapchat at andberk, that's A-N-D-B-E-R-K, to see firsthand a day in the life of an entrepreneur in cities all around the world. 